So normally when we get around to coordinating like this, though, uh, it's quite often because there's some other guys that we're coordinating against. And this is in biology called multi-level selection. However, I don't think we should think that's the only reason we ever do this. I do think that there are problems that we face as a species that are sufficient that we might be able to coordinate together as a species. Um, so I, I just really want to emphasize a lot of people kind of go around saying, what is AI going to do to us? You know, what is the future going to be? As if there's some single thing that could be researched. And, and, and some people get tens of millions of euros to, to find out, you know, to do the science of machine behavior, to find out what, what AI is just going to do, right? It's just false. Individual decisions absolutely matter. Um, and how, like, what do you do? What do you spend your time and money on engineering or science or art or regulation? You, you are all getting to choose like what kinds of innovations you're contributing to. And we can see this also by um, the regulatory decisions people take do affect the outcomes in societies. So for example, China is very worried that, that they're becoming too expensive and not competitive anymore. And so they actually have laws that say that what you should be doing with, your, um, with AI is, is reducing uh, the, the costs of human, right? So, so it is basically this idea that, that it is supposed to commodify uh, labor so that China will, will be inexpensive again. Um, whereas when we look at what Germany is doing, uh, the, the same companies that invest in automation tend to be the same ones that invest in retraining. And so 70% of the people whose jobs go away, um, and at least this is one recent uh, paper I've been working on for like a decade. I was working with a very old preprint until just this year, it finally came out. Um, the... Uh, they, that 70% wind up with better jobs, more cognitive jobs, and also better paying. However, about 20 or 30% wind up uh, being made redundant, as we say in British. So basically, it's an opportunity mm -hmm. to get around the difficult labor laws and, and lose the, the people that don't want to move forward or, or that you don't think are the best or whatever. So it is true that some people lose to work. And that's been found also in, in other areas like the Netherlands. But anyway, I think part of the reason that, that Germany mostly uses it for, um, for really benefiting people is because of the very strong labor uh, uh, involvement, not just uh, you know, law, but also the fact that you have people talking to the executive at the executive level. As someone in Britain, Britain has stronger uh, labor laws than the U.S. I mean, you, they're, they're certainly the university professors are not unionized in the U.S., uh, but they were often able, they're often manipulated into working against their own interests. When you're actually in the boardroom in the C-suite, then, uh, then I think you get better outcomes. So I'm very impressed by the way things work here. Anyway, um, so speaking of such things, a lot of people worry that uh, when you bring AI in, that wages are going to go down. And that's been repeatedly shown not to happen. And I really, uh, this, this is one particular paper, but I really, really recommend the work of this guy, James Besson. Uh, at Boston University does a lot of great work on that, about um, when you bring new technology in, often actually the employment goes up because you've made each uh, employee more valuable. So like more people can move into the area that's been automated. But what this is showing is that the kind of thing you would think a robot would do, this, uh, it's called a, a routine task something, I don't remember. Um, those tasks, if you're not being defended by a union, uh, the salaries went way down. So this guy was showing this to tell us about how important unions were uh, because AI was doing this. And me, as someone who actually knew about AI, it was mostly a bunch of labor people that were in the room. I said, um, excuse me, why, why if this is AI, does it stop in 1995? And he said, well, we economists think nothing much has happened in AI since 2000. <laughs> I was like, you know, seriously, you know, laugh at love. No, what actually happened here, and this wasn't James Betts, this is like David Otter, is one of the big authors in this area is this is when China came into the World Trade Organization. So these same tasks that people think are the kind that you automate are actually also the ones that are easier to outsource. And if you, again, these same guy, the same group of people here, uh, when you look at Germany, when did, the, when did wages come down? It was, guess what? You guys, guess when, when would wages suddenly start coming down in Germany? When did you suddenly have access to a whole lot of new employees? 1991. Exactly. <laughs> so the opening of the East, including East Germany, let alone Poland and, you know, Czech and whatever. So, uh, um, 
So, uh, yeah, so that was already the first part of my talk. <laughs> okay, so we've gone through a little bit the decentralization versus empowerment, which is going to be the framing of the rest of the talk. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about sort of the AI, the, 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 um, the whatever, post-humanism kind of perspective. Um, and then I'm going to come down and talk about, well, what kinds of actors can we expect to regulate AI? And then finally, I'm going to talk about um, really polarization. Actually, I'm not going to talk about antitrust. I should have edited that out. But if you have questions, there's some slides at the end. I can do a little bit more. <laughs> but um, I, I was worried about keeping to an hour. So yeah, this is a, a, you can find a number of papers where I talk about this kind of thing. So, I mean, you guys are computer scientists, I think, mostly. How many people actually did an undergraduate or graduate degree in computer science? A few. Okay. Well, how many people have done uh, combinatorics? You know, something on computational complexity? Eh, a little. Okay. Well, just, first of all, just trust me. Computation is a systematic transformation of information, which means it's a physical process. It takes time, space, energy, and infrastructure, right? You, that's why you go and you buy more memory to, and you make, or, you, or you, uh, you, know, you have to plug in your computer, things like that. It's not just some magic spontaneous you know, access into the uh, ether through the pineal gland or something, right? It, it's something that, it's a physical process. Um, so we're never going to get to the point where we have absolute omniscience, right? That we're not going to be able to predict the future. We're only better and better at doing that, but we're not going to have it perfectly. The only perfect model of the universe is the universe. This is actually called the map of Germany question, problem. I, the perfect map of Germany is the same size as Germany. I have no idea why it's called map of Germany. Someone should figure out the history. I should, I guess, since I keep bringing this up. Anyway, so an intelligence is just a subset of all the kinds of computation that specifically maps context to action, right? Intelligence is stuff that does stuff. Base appropriate to you know not just falling down a hill because you know you're a rock and, and you and you dropped you know, <laughs> but rather that you're adjusting to to your to your your action, and each intelligent agent only perceives a subset of the universe. I was interesting. I was having a big argument with this about this with Chris Bishop on on stage, of course, so maximally embarrassing. A super smart guy, right? But he really didn't believe me that that you know, AI was already smarter than people. And then I, the one thing that made him really uh, go, oh, you're right, was the fact that with, you know, with cameras, we can detect every wave frequency of light and humans only have a small subset, right? We have infrared and whatever, ultraviolet, um, that we know we can't see. It's like, oh, right. Just that there isn't one thing. Yeah. But we're all, we're all taking a subset uh, of bio biological life uh, that, that we've specialized in, right? Um, that we have a niche that we've constructed. So I, I really, um, it's funny because unlike the EU, uh, uh, the, Google uses its own chips everywhere. I think we're getting more into building our own chips now. But anyway, um, they have globally their own fiber optic label because they noticed that their own government, the, the, the national the Snowden showed them that their own government had hacked them. So they couldn't trust anyone. And they even think if there's somebody else in the same fiber optic cable bundle that they might start detecting the signals there. So they, they everything is secret. Um, so anyway, and then they also have these giant things that you say paper mills or whatever, which is where they do not, not their servers and things now, right? A lot of people used to think that AI was algorithms, and now they think it's data, that data magically transforms. I call it the Rumpelstiltskin fallacy, right? that you magically transform data into intelligence. Um, and as big of a hot pile of data as you have, that's how big a pile of intelligence you'll get afterwards. Right? So, but it's more than that. There's an awful lot of, of infrastructure that's required to make all these things happen. And I really think that we need to start reasoning about this stuff as a transnational asset. right? Because um, it, well, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but the, but the point is that all these companies, maybe not the Chinese ones, but all the American companies uh, use uh, uh, talent sourced from across the world. They use data sourced from across the world, right? And, and like I said, they have, they're wrapping the world in, in their own uh, communication networks. So I, I don't think we can reason about this only as like an American company, right? Okay. So artificial intelligence is intelligence somebody built. And I'm going to say here deliberately, all right? Um, agents, uh, some people say, well, that's not really all I meant when I meant in intelligence, you know, artificial intelligence. I meant agency. Well, again, there's a lot of definitions of agents. If you're, if you're, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? Oh, not true. I, well, lots of people. I, I was thinking of the uh, Donald Davidson. Uh, 
but there's then, then they by agent they really mean quite a lot. But there's also agents which are just any vector change. So like there's the chemical agent. So if you have a chemical reaction, which chemicals were the ones that, that made the reaction happen? So we could go through like lots and lots of words and argue about what they mean, but there's two terms that I find really super useful. They're out of philosophy. So moral agents are, I think, the things we really care about here. It's not just do you change things, but are you responsible for what you change? And it's important to realize that this varies by society. Different societies have a different idea of how old you have to be to be an adult, how old you can be to consent to sex, right? How old you can be to consent to marriage, how old you can be to fight a war. These are things that, that a society and sometimes a family decides, right? So similarly, um, moral patients are the things that are considered the responsibility of that society's agents. So, for example, people are starting to realize that the environment is our responsibility, where it used to be seen as just something that was there, you know, that was provided and whatever. So I would argue, so this stuff is just definitional, again, if you look up those terms, but the whole term moral patient is not that old. It's like 50 years old or so, right? But, um, but this is the thing that used to be controversial. Now people are kind of taking it for granted. Uh, that uh, ethics is something that's determined by and determines a society. So I found out that a lot of philosophers hated me for saying this stuff, which I didn't know because I didn't read enough philosophy. <laughs> but it was, and it turned out it was because they really want to say, they, th they saw this as cultural relativism, and they say, no, I want to say that our society is more ethical than it used to be or something. Well, you can still say that. You just have to say on by which ethics. So our society is more ethical because more people have access to work or education or, or our infant mortality has gone down or something, right? But there's not just a single ethics. You just have to pick one and then you can still do that. So, and I would argue that the, the ethics we keep come up with, we're constantly working on. Just like we can't have perfect intelligence, we also can't have perfect fairness. And so we're constantly, so you know this thing about that uh, you can't have both a quality of outcome and also a quality of opportunity unless you start from an already perfectly fair society, right? So either, if, so, so say, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know, you can choose gender or something. So, but you, did you get that? I, could, I can work through the example if you want. Everybody, okay. <laughs> yeah. If there was already a lot of people, oh, education's a great one. The, China worked really hard to try to break the link between uh, sort of royal families or whatever and, and academic achievement. And, and so, um, but it turns out that uh, if you gave, so, so they, they just said you couldn't even go to university unless your parents were either like uh, farm, you know, agricultural workers or, or, or worked in the military or worked in factories, okay? Then they found themselves falling behind the Soviet Union in terms of weapon systems and things. And so then they said, no, fairness is equality of opportunity. And even though they've had an entire decade of repressing the elite, the elite all did better on the tests again. So once that going to university went back to being equality of opportunity, which was done by a test, then the elite were back in the dominant position. So anyway, that's you have to choose one is the point. I'm not, I'm not advocating for, for either Chinese solution, but I'm just saying that, that you don't get it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about responsibility. I would argue that responsibility is the, it, it's a defining feature of being a moral agent. That's what it means, that we hold each other to account, um, right? And that's what it means to be a moral agent. You're, you're part of the society and we expect that you're going to uh, uh, do certain things and that's what responsibility is. And, and I would argue that this requires a peer relationship because otherwise we couldn't force each other <laughs> to do the things, we couldn't hold each other. And force isn't quite the right word. Trust is when you allow others to do different things, right? You don't micromanage them. But both of those imply that there's some kind of pureness. It's not exact pureness, but some, some kind of pureness. And so accountability is a society's capacity to trace responsibility, that's easier. And this is the thing we mostly want from AI. So I don't like the term responsible AI either. I like it when we talk about accountability, and uh, transparency. Transparency is the means by which you, uh, you figure out, you can attribute accountability, all right? But some people think that transparency is like, you know, open code or something like it, that transparency is itself the goal. But again, just like the rest of the, the, the combinatorial explosions, too much transparency is not transparent, <laughs> ironically, right? You can't figure out what's going on if you have millions of lines of code. So what you want is accountability. And then when you realize that that's the goal, 
then you can figure out how, what good transparency looks like and how much effort to put into your transparency. All right, so why can't it be that, you know, nothing I've said so far has really said why you don't want to have AI be your peer, why AI isn't uh, something that you're co-creating the, the world with. Um, and the reason is basically that the whole way that we keep our responsibility going is through a system that's really more about dissuasion than recompense. Right. So a lot of people think the law is about like, you did something wrong. You stole my bike. The police go, they find my bike, they give it back to me. OK, that, you know, that's that's occasionally that happens, but that's not, you know, that, that costs money. It costs effort. And usually there's some fines or something that might happen. Right. So the fines, you know, I, I am blown away when I watch you know, on television where like there's been like a murder or something. And then a person is found and they're sent to jail. And people say, well, I'm glad I finally, you know, that there's, there's been justice. You know, there, there's, nothing, there's no equivalent between someone going to, to jail and having a member of your family, right? They're, those are not, that is not recompense. It is about dissuasion. But we've evolved, we have co-evolved with our, our society of justice so much that we feel like we got something back when that person goes to jail, right? And, and when we have some kind of advantage over them. And to, to some extent, we have got something. We've got a little more security because other people might be displaced from doing that same thing, right? So safe, secure, accountable software systems are modular. And so I don't think we're ever going to build an AI system that suffers from isolation or loss um, in a way that, uh, in, in a reliable way, basically, that we can reliably say that we both know this is secure software, that we can account, that we're, we, can, we can be accountable, we can be transparent. And also that it really is going to care if you put it to jail or you, you find it or something like that. Like in, 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 the, in this essential way that not just humans, like guppies and sheep and things like that, the worst thing that can happen is to isolate them, right? And it's weird that it's only been in the last decades that we've finally acknowledged this, that uh, solitary confinement is a form of torture, right? Well, it is for dogs too. So um, no penalty of law against any artifact, including shell companies, right? We, we, we said a lot of things like that, kind of efficacy. The humans are the accountable moral agents and we have to hold them to account. And that's why we need the, the, the AI systems to, be, to move through it. And my argument is that if we really hold corporations effectively to account, then they create appropriate levels of transparency because it's their job in court to prove due diligence. The basic thing that happens is if something goes wrong, you want to show that you did everything in your power and then you tend to get kind of let off the hook and the taxpayer pays for it, right? But if you did something wrong, you didn't do the best you could, then, uh, then you wind up paying all the costs. And this is what in most products is the way that, that we keep order. Um, all right, so yeah, enforcement has to be against humans with executive control. And if you don't know why I'm saying that last part, look up this really beautiful phrase, moral crumple zone. So this idea that you just have someone who, who goes to jail that had actually no control over the system, but you go, oh, look, someone went to jail. Like, no. Okay. So a lot of people think we can't be transparent with AI because there's like 30 trillion weights and like nobody knows what they mean. But we also, we have, we're, we have accountability and, and transparency and audits and things like that in banks. And banks are full of people and people have like, you know, 3 trillion connections in their brains too. Right? Nobody goes into a bank and says, what are the neurons and the synapses doing in, their, in the brains of all your employees? So I think what we need to audit, and this is, this is the European law, incidentally, if you're looking at the, AI, the audits in the AI Act and the Digital Services Act, they're procedural audits. They're not like, show us what the weights are doing. <laughs> they're saying, how do you know that the system works? Did you go through the best practices? Oh, and incidentally, yeah, going through best practices, doing due diligence and, and avoiding worst practice, that, um, that keeps ratcheting up. That's why you don't have to worry about how, how, the, how can the law possibly keep up with AI. It's the, we, when we publish articles in, in conferences or when trade journals say, oh, this is the best way to do DevOps, that's what establishes what the, what the current uh, due diligence is, right? So you don't have to change the law every day that every time someone has some insight. So anyway, a good, a good maintainable systems engineering software includes, you know, you architected the system in the first place, right? I, I, uh, the, the Future of Life Institute <laughs> frequently bashed on LinkedIn recently um, because of their slow down AI article. But I, I, I was at a meeting, I this is a harder bash. <laughs> I was at a meeting where one of them was standing there going, what if you had 
this chess, you decided to teach, you wanted something to learn how to play chess. So you told it it had to learn how to play chess. And then you turn it off every night and it notices that you're doing this. And so it shoots you. It's like, well, you know, if, if we know, right, if we build a chess program, it doesn't even represent day and night, right? There's no day and night in chess. So there, there's no way it could have noticed that, right? It doesn't connect to a gun, right? What, what chess program has, <laughs> it has any way to grasp a gun, right? Or, or, or no, again, no one is or whatever. And then finally, show me one program in the world that turns off their computer at night, right? Like that's when they want them, the training to happen, right? They, it was when, so they won't interfere with what they're trying to do. That's the best time for the learning to happen. This just shows complete ignorance and a lot of money from Elon Musk. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So anyway, you architect the system and that determines whether you put a gun in it, for example. Right? Um, you secure the system. We need the cybersecurity. You know, the, the, I don't know if people remember, it's like three years back now, but the solar winds hacks against a lot of governments, um, it wasn't their software and it wasn't the libraries they linked. It was the libraries of the libraries they linked. So it was too farther back in the, in the, in the logistics chain for their software was where the hack came. And yeah, it looks like people are starting to do, at least the Russians are claiming, and according to the recent leaks, uh, that that they uh, that they are trying to do data injections into quite a lot of the social media stuff and things. So we do have to worry about that. I used to think that was just something that people like to like write papers about, but who's going to do that? <laughs> anyway, you need to log with secure revision control every change to code base. This is normal. This was radical in the 1980s, right? And for some reason, AI companies don't do it. Most software companies do. Certainly, all the companies that just have software, including AI. That, but are actually automotive or medical or pharma or, or you know, petrochemical, they all do this, right? DevOps is pretty basic now. And yet AI, just AI companies often don't do this. And you get, you talk about, I give this talk and there's a guy from UI. It's like, you say that that stuff is there, but you, know, you go into those companies and it's not there. You can't find those documents. I'm like, I didn't say that all AI is transparent. I said, it's, easily easy to make it transparent <laughs> okay but if it's not there if they don't keep this document it's culpable right that's this is what i'm trying to convince and this is going to be true under the ai act right at least for the high risk systems so logs of testing before and during release right if if especially if the learning is changing mm -hmm. right inputs and decisions this is already done that's why you know like again, in decently regulated systems, what's going wrong? Like, like we all know, like what the car thought it saw when it hit the lady that was pushing her bike across the the highway in front of the Tesla, right? Do you remember this? It was in the it was in the front page news within three days. It's like, oh, she was homeless and she had like ragged clothes, so it thought paper was blowing across, and then it saw the bike, so then it thought it was a cyclist going the direction of traffic, and then it realized it had no idea what was going on, so it alerted the driver. And the driver had half a second to go what, <laughs> right? You know, we know that because a car manufacturer would do this. And the rest of, a, of, of us in AI and software and robotics should be doing this too, okay? And um, the point is all this stuff also benefits developers. That's all we started doing in the 1980s. We weren't worried about software audits. We just wanted to be able to know who would change stuff and be able to fix it if it went wrong, right? So it benefits us, but it's also auditable. So obviously, therefore, if you're really good with digital technology, transparency should be easy, especially say if you're the top communication company in the world. So that's why nothing like this ever happens, right? <laughs> that they, do you know what I'm talking about here, right? It's not that, that, uh, that not half of Google, but some huge fraction of Google fought with the rest of Google, right? So I, I know uh, at least two of these people. I, I, I chat on the, on, the, um, on the social media with another one, but that's, that's my, Meg Mitchell down there and that's Emily Bender. But the, um, anyway, but this is not actually what I want to talk about. I, I know a lot more about this, which was the Google ATF case. And again, there was the same kind of thing where they had spent years putting this together. You know, I, I had signed a contract months before it got, you guys got notified in the news or whatever. And yet, um, they were shut down with, by a Twitter storm and, and in, a, in a letter with a few thousand signatures. And you're just like, what is going on? Because they really, they had, <laughs> that guy is now the head of the CIA, right? <laughs> William Burns. This is, this is non-trivial. And K. Cole James is one of the excuse they wanted, they were looking for ways to tear it down. But when they, 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 the excuse they used was, 
the first person of color or woman who'd been in charge of heritage, which is yes, right of center, but not that far. <laughs> you know, but, but you know, she's she was one of the only two African American women in the Bush administration, right? So anyway, uh, why could a company, the best leading communication company, not uh, be able to communicate even internally? I'm not saying which side is right, but why couldn't they agree if, I, if we're talking about all these capacities, right? Well, presumably they could up again to this, these limits of time, space, and energy. But I think what's going on is that you literally had some actors whose highest priority was, and, I, and people in California are weirdly afraid of losing agency. They really, really think that um, like somehow they're going to fall, fall behind. And I guess you know, they've all seen, it does happen. Sometimes companies become unimportant. Um, but then there's other actors that were literally hired to do nothing but ensure ethical integrity. Right, that was their jobs, and so maybe this was more less of a failure of communication, more of a logical impasse. Right, so uh, the apparent breakdown of transparency might, as I said, be a logical. It's like you know, you, you could be as transparent if you want, as you want, but you know, I'm, I can't read the text on the web. Although well, maybe I could Google Translate thing. Right, I, I, I just took, I picked Georgian. You can pick any non-European language. It's going to be really hard. Probably says duty free. <laughs> I probably says duty free. Yeah. <laughs> so my my current thinking after all that was that the information age means we need to handle basic truths. We're going to. I remember when Facebook was new, and you, for the first time you saw your friends not talking to you how like how they talk to you, but talking in this totally different way to their other friends, right? It's because people used to have a different persona, and they all had to get merged down to one because everyone was seeing them post all the time. Um, so we, we're just going to have to handle the fact that, like, you know, parents have to handle the fact that, that their kids have lovers and whatnot, you know. Um, but it also means that um, we're all more empowered than we've ever been before. We have all this information. We can also move around. Uh, you know, transport is, is less expensive. So my own opinion is that we need to, uh, with all of our technology, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about government and AI at the same time because I lived through Trump and Brexit. And a lot of people during that really believed government did nothing for them, even though they were sitting in this, you know, clean, safe, relatively, you know, like incredibly structured ecosystem. They, they didn't see where the government was. So anyway, I think we need to communicate at a high level of abstraction and people like what we were doing and then sort of provide drill down points so that if you want to know more, this is where you go. And there's no way, again, because of the, the limits of, of combinatorics and communication and time and money and everything else, that you're going to make it so everyone can understand everything. I mean, some people literally don't even have, you know, cerebellums. They are just, you know, they, they, can't, they can't understand anything, right? That, that's just the way it is. But we can do the best we can, and we can document what the barriers are. Maybe you're going to have to get security clearance. Maybe you're going to have to get a PhD. I mean, again, some of the people when I was on this council were saying, there shouldn't be any councils. They're, they're like, everyone should make all the decisions. I'm like, you're, this is like a postdoc at MIT. I'm like, what can that mean? You have time to think about everything that's happening in every government and every planet, you know, every company, like what? <laughs> you know, it was just really weird. So anyway, you, and, and which languages? Again, you, I don't know, this may happen to you too. You, you wind up in rooms where people are saying, what about these like languages that only have 10,000 speakers? And it's like, they're not going to have enough data to have as good of translations as languages with 10 million speakers. And that's just the way it works, right? And there's nothing we can do. It's the unfairness. This goes back to fairness and, and the, the, what, where we were. Although I know people are working on trying to make it easier. If you get a good model of what language looks like, maybe you can use less data and do pretty well. But I think you'll always still do better where you have the, well, to some extent, the more data. So if we conquer polarization, which is later in the talk, <laughs> these barriers, I think, will be more acceptable. I think part of what, what, what freaks people out is that also the paranoia of, of polarization. But before I talk about polarization, I'll talk about uh, nations. How are we doing for time? I'm going to try to finish at five. So, um, so a lot of people, again, I don't know how much this happens in Germany. I should have asked you guys more questions. We didn't have like a coffee break first or something. Uh, the, but... Uh, a lot of people in the U.S. are saying, well, you know, the whole idea of states is over, right? Like, why do we need this de decentralization? But actually, a lot of problems are local. You know, uh, I have had vaccination up for more than three years, I promise you. <laughs> you know, air pollution, food and water supplies, general education, physical security, physical intimacy, right? Um, 
that if even if you don't have children, the way it's going to be to live in your neighborhood is determined partly by the education that your neighbor's children have, have you know, it, it, you just have to realize things like this. So, um, and, you know, beyond just the logical aspects, we also now have legal rights for 70 odd years, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which every single nation is at this point acknowledged. Um, states that every nation, every state, sorry, not every nation, every country is responsible for the well-being of all human borders, whether or not they're citizens, right? Uh, some countries, including the one from which my accent uh, derives, don't even provide uh, some of these, uh, these stated rights for their citizens, let alone their residents. Um, but anyway, the, so for example, uh, universal health care is one of the, 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 the things in this. Um, but anyway, if we assume that there's no failed states, which is a big assumption in one moment, the nations compose a full sphere of protection. So everyone has at least one country defending their human rights. Okay. So one of the questions we have, though, and again, you do talk like this, it's one thing to be standing in Germany if you're even zooming to Vietnam and people say, wait, you trust governments? <laughs> you know? And uh, so, yeah, one, one question is whether one sphere is actually enough. Um, so what if a government is corrupt? Um, and what about companies? Is, is so a lot of people really expect that like Facebook and Google and things should enforce our, you know, our Western uh, uh, attitudes on any place that they go. I mean, at least it used to be. I'm not sure right now, but it used one of my friends, uh, Dave Gunkel, uh, believe it or not, we're friends. We actually knew each other in Chicago um, well before either of us got into AI ethics. Um, but anyway, he makes all his students read terms and conditions. <laughs> and apparently the Facebook one said that any national government may have all the data on any of their citizens. And that's why Myanmar uh, allowed Facebook in. That was, Facebook was the only uh, internet service that was allowed in Myanmar, right? Well, you know, <laughs> some people don't think you want to give all the data to all the, the countries. Um, anyway, so, and then there's another question, which is, if you do go and you have like, okay, and I have now there are, you know, you'll see some of the big tech companies in the UN, you know, at World Economic Forum, whatever. Um, but you don't want to have giant monopolies. We'll come back to that a little bit, right? All the time. We don't want to privilege them. So is there some way that we can represent, you know, ordinary companies, you know, little tiny ones like SAP, uh, you know, no, but seriously in startups and everything else, uh, can we, can they do something like the EU has done and somehow uh, be important too and sit at the table? Um, I think, I think maybe, I mean, this is a, this is not uh, answers, but I do think maybe we, there should be something that we can do with NGOs and, and uh, corporations. And we are, we're kind of enforcing things on them. Um, there, uh, there's a big question about the government thing. Uh, governments tend to think that the governments themselves are the ones that should regulate each other. So I just said a thing at UNESCO about this. And they, they really said, look, you know, part of the reason the governments do things like shut down the internet access is because they, those governments can't telephone, you know, Twitter or Facebook or whatever, like uh, the America, America could or the EU could. And so if they had if they had regional coalitions then they could like probably come to better solutions. I don't know if that's true, but that's the way they're thinking about it in UNESCO. Um, so far, at least in Europe, there, there may be one or two independent SME organizations, but quite a lot of them are organized and coordinated and fed by, uh, by big tech. And I think a lot of people don't realize when they're asking for things like uh, interoperability, that they're often asking um, to, to, to plug little companies to be forced to use the data representation that one of the larger companies is using um, because they don't all save the kind of information. They don't all have the same business. So there's this, the, again, false belief that all the companies have all the data and, and they're just not, they're not giving it away and it's all the same. Anyway, I actually really like the U <laughs> and I took this picture myself and a lot of these pictures I took myself. Uh, not not the not the NASA one, <laughs> but anyway. So uh, we're we're one of the top three economies in the world, and and it's a little hard to tell which one sometimes. Um, and we're living in very uh, several important uh, global issues. I don't even know if we still are the biggest leader in sustainability. Some other areas have gotten really good at that, but now we're leading more in digital regulation, which is kind of interesting. Although China does its job of that kind of business on companies. 
Um, and then, yeah, the fact that we have we don't have companies that are more powerful than governments is not necessarily a sign of weakness. It might be a sign of regulatory strength. So that's not what Eric Schmidt thinks. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't, this is again one of those things, I might not have been in the room except that it was COVID time and I got invited to the room and, and it was a, a Zoom room. And I was not a speaker, I was just a, a but I was chat, I was writing in the chat going, what? <laughs> you know. Um, but Schmidt is saying, too bad you don't have your own AI to regulate. <laughs> you literally said that, right? And uh, so I just made this argument earlier that I would say that it is uh, global AI. But secondly, that thing I just told you about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a lot of like the, the GDPR is defending, we've recognized that your data is an aspect of your person. You can be manipulated through your data just like you can be manipulated if somebody grabs your shoulder, right? Not exactly the same, but you know, analogously. So anyway, um, uh, the reason that this whole paper came up, which flashed by on the uh, outlines there uh, that you're about to see, is because I was really sick of versions of this slide. This is when we pulled off the internet, but I was sitting in front of yet another talk with this slide, and I just met this woman. We were both at a meeting on, on uh, antitrust and market concentration. I didn't even know what those meant, but I've learned to go to meetings when I'm invited and I don't know what they're about, um, because usually that means it would be one of two or three people that has any idea of what AI is, and maybe the only one that's not from the commercial industry, so they, they, I, I can provide value. So anyway, I'm sitting in this meeting and I'm like, isn't it bad to have to be of companies? Why are they only showing the top you know, 20 companies or whatever? And she it turned out to work for Director General of Competition. She's like, you know, she's like, well, what even is a platform? What is the definition here? How do we know that these even are the largest you know, important companies? What's going on? So I notice here that like, you know, up here, it's, there it says Asia, right? It says Asia here. But yeah, here it says China. Do you know what Samsung, where Samsung is domiciled? Yeah, Korea. Korea, yeah. It's, it, Korea is not exactly aligned with uh, China most of the time. So anyway, yeah, we're conflating ancient China. But this, is, this is misinformation in my book. Um, so what Helena Melikova and I did was, uh, well, I should really, I, I just wrote a lot of text. <laughs> she, uh, she did the work. Um, was uh, what Helena decided was first of all, she just chose one part of the WIPO uh, system that, that's the world uh, IP patent uh, thing. So it's a global patent, it's a particular classification for computer systems based on specific computational models. So she thought that's a pretty good classification. So this isn't all the AI in the world, but she took every company that had done at least two patents in 2019. Okay. And um, and then, so what's on the x-axis here is uh, what is the market cap, and it's y. This is y log. Um, and what's on the y-axis is the number of patents. So we just we looked at both measures. Okay. Um, and then the colors are telling you the global region. And uh, in case you can't just sum that up in your head, uh, I, I, <laughs> the uh, what you see is that China and and Europe are not that different. In fact, it's much closer if, uh, except the SAP didn't have to have two. <laughs> Actually, the largest uh, companies in, in Europe, like Europe, not, this is the where the GDPR enforces, are Hoffman LaRouche, and I forget what the other one was. But anyway, they're, they're, they're uh, Swiss. And what is Switzerland known for? Right? So there's something, uh, I mean, a number of things, of course. But anyway, there's something funny going on. And the other thing is that these are basically, both, well, actually all three of these areas are about 20% of the world's um, GDP. And the other 40% over here, the rest of the world, um, is basically double <laughs> the amount of Europe and China, right? In there, so I think that AI has become integral to the digital economy, which is integral to the economy, right? And, and you're going to see things usually proportionate, although there's something funny happening with America. Uh, but it certainly doesn't look like they need our help against China, <laughs> right? Not from these two measures, which is the measures that were on that, that other graph, right? So it's not like necessarily the best measures, but it wasn't. Nice. So what, what's the number of why you have the 352? Um, patents. So, that's the, patents. This is, so yeah, so the, these are numbers of patents, and this is the amount of market cap. Sorry, it's one of those evil graphs that has two things. Yeah. <laughs> I, I should have said that better. Um, so this incidentally, I have another uh, choose a master's in actually, and we've submitted this for publication. 
Um, this is what 2019 looked like if you looked at even having a single patient. It was just that Helena, again, talked about scale, didn't have time. But if you looked at every single patient, uh, it turns out that uh, Europe was actually ahead of China at that point. Um, and interestingly, Japan was making up an awful lot of the difference for patents already. Um, and then the funny thing, so this paper was published in, in, uh, in 2021. Um, uh, no, 2020, it was, oh yeah, no, we wrote it in 2020. It was getting passed around, but it came out in early 2021. So looking at the end of 2021, there's like some weird uh, uh, patent war going on between Japan and China. It's really quite striking. Um, but also because of the, the COVID, the market capitalization in the U.S. had just rocketed. Um, I think we haven't done the numbers for this year yet, but there's a real question what's going on there. Um, and you can see the, uh, yeah, <laughs> the, sorry, if I'm train, you know, <laughs> but the, um, the, the, a lot of these numbers, I mean, where, where Tesla, why is Tesla worth this much? I think it's people thought they were investing in Bitcoin or something. I don't know. Anyway, but. Let's talk a little bit about patents. I, I mean, monopoly. This is a brief little conversation monopoly. The idea is that um, that if you have, so this is like this really basic uh, abstraction. So now the y-axis is price, and the the x-axis is how much you sell. So this is the quantity that you would sell if uh, you're at a competitive price. So if we if we have this this number here is. Uh, and this is supply demand, right? So if you cost too much, nobody's going to buy it. And if you cost nothing, then most people just take it, right? So that's that's the slope over here. And so the idea is that um, if you have lots of people competing in a the market, then this is the then you're going to come to a price that's basically about how much it costs to make this stuff. So you know people are getting paid, they're getting salaries and what, but you're not making a lot of profit. You're just you're just breaking even. Um, and that's the idea of of of, uh, of a world with competition. In a world with monopoly, you can pick some other random price that you're going to sell because hey, there's no one you're competing with. And then uh, the advantage is that uh, you you make all this pink money here, right? Now, because this is how much it actually costs to make it. And even though fewer people are buying it, you uh, you get all this money uh, for free. Uh, however, uh, economists consider that. They're kind of neutral about whether you get to make money or the consumers get value, which the, the, the consumers presumably were, thought they were getting value. That's why they were paying for it. So they're saying that's a wash, which I don't know how you make that up. But anyway, they're saying this triangle here, losing it is definitely good. So whether or not it's okay for profit to have profits rather than consumer value, you definitely don't want like everything just falling. That's like a, a big loss. Okay. I've just taught you all I know about that. Okay. But... Um, but isn't that, I mean, when you talk to farmers, to, to um, farmer giants, they say that's what you need to develop new products. So it's again value going into the future. Yeah, yeah. So they think, they think that, um, that uh, yeah. So they think that they need, yeah, they need this to, to create a new product. Um, again, I don't know where I would put that because they're still competing with each other or something. But, there's, but there is this question about, um, I don't know. I, I don't know how I would rank that, but I was, let me show you what I know more about, which is telcos. <laughs> okay. So the European telcos right now are claiming that our broadband situation is bad because they're not allowed to merge and to, and, and to become more monopolistic, right? And so we decided to, this is another, th really is mostly with uh, uh, Helena Malikova there, but we get people to help us sometimes. <laughs> uh, but she, she uh, this is again more of her renting really, but, but going on and checking the data. So, um, so first of all, there's this whole question about um, who is spending more on, uh, on infrastructure. And in terms of, I believe this in terms of percent of their, of their revenue, actually the European ones are already spending a lot more on, uh, on uh, infrastructure than Americans are anyway. But let's have a look at the, the size thing. First, I have to show you a graph. Okay, so here's, here's the users, right? And then there's people that are providing actual content. And then there's also um, the telephone companies, right? And so the telephone companies are going to be these dotted lines. The blue and black are going to be like uh, content providers. And then the greens are the ad exchanges, right? And the ad exchanges get the advertisers to these guys on their line, okay? 
And the, there, there's other there's other ad agencies that help you deal with the green guys if you want to, but you don't have to actually the advertisers don't have to go directly to the yeah, ad exchanges. All right, so those colors are the key to this. Now you may notice this a shockingly few <laughs> of uh, these ad exchange things. And now, just to make things more confusing, so the, the x-axis here is uh, profitability in percentage, and the y-axis is growth, okay? So basically, neither of the people creating uh, stuff, you know, the creators are the Netflix here. Um, and uh, neither they nor the telcos are really growing that much because basically everyone already gets newspapers. Everybody already has a telephone, right? So there's not that much growth, but there's a lot of profitability. And this, is, this was what I actually set off this whole research. It's just like, you, you don't usually have people that are making profit. I mean, this is profit is this way, right? They're making that much money asking for permission to do something illegal like merch when they don't need to, right? So why are these guys really, you know, needing this? Well, and over there, so the average profitability over there for Facebook is around 50%. And this is before we've looked at their investment in infrastructure. Now, actually, all, all these guys do invest in infrastructure. Um, but uh, after they've invested in infrastructure, so now Facebook is down to nearly 45% profits. <laughs> after they've, they've done this, um, you see that, that the European telcos, and, and this is actually what some uh, monopoly theory would tell you, of course, they're less likely, smaller companies are more likely to do what the government wants them to do, basically, they have less power, right, or something, and, and what, they, what the city and democracies with the citizens want them to do, the channels, right? So, the, so they're, they are making less money now after that because they invest more in infrastructure. But they're still making about the same amount of money as the people actually producing the content. And so if you're looking for extra money, if you think there's money to be had that could be pumped into more broadband, there are other things over there that are further to the right that you might want to think about how to tax. All right. So I, I don't need to. So um, and I, I'm just coming back to this whole uh, uh, obscuring. Uh, what I told you there was what we said in the paper, which I didn't, it didn't occur to me to look into this in great uh, detail. This was it's from, um, it's like these numbers were from the uh, IMF. I just looked it up when we were writing the paper. This 2019 IMF, because those 2019 numbers we're looking at. Um, but then I saw this graph. Now, if you don't know, and why would you, unless you're into this kind of thing, the IMF is, is usually chaired by someone who's French. And the World Bank is usually chaired by someone who's American. And even the World Bank admits that in 2007, the Europe was the, the, the Eurozone alone was the largest uh, currency in the world. It was the large, largest economy in the world. But then they, they like suddenly they think Europe is like doing this weird jangly thing. Like, why is it more jangly than the other lines? It's got as many people as the US, right? That's very weird. And this is what the European Bank thinks, the, UCB, the European Central Bank. And to me, that was plausible. So Russia. So not in Russia, China, <laughs> just getting up around 2020 to finally be the largest economy. But really the, the British and, and, and sorry, not the British, the European and American economies is completely similar. Okay. So wait, wait sorry, wait, and how do you come to the difference here? Oh, yeah. So so just that here, here, the Europe with the UK is 22%, China is 16% in 2019. And US is 2025. This and China's not on this, although there it is. There's China. And, and 2019 is like here. And, and they're making <laughs> like Europe is anywhere near. Um, yeah, it, it, they don't have Europe halfway between. I, I just didn't think, and we're there, they're all looking like they're in 2019, they're almost the same, right? And China's flying ahead. So I'm just saying these are three totally different numbers from three agencies that all should know. So you know, we don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just want to point out that, that even this, these things are, are stuff people uh, don't agree on. So um, I don't know how much time do I have left talk about. Yeah. All right. Well, I could talk about, I've got three minutes because I'm going to leave some Q&A besides those couple questions you guys have asked. Um, and I have a lot more slides. <laughs> but I just want to point out that, um, that, uh, that nobody immigrates to China. You know, a lot of people say, oh, China's winning. Nobody goes there willingly. Nobody willingly goes to Russia, migrates to Russia. Um, 
And so it may be, why is it that, that people don't want to go into autocracies? Maybe it's because they're not great for if you're a minority. Um, although, like I said, Iraq used to be the best place to be uh, for, for freedom of expression, except as long as you didn't get in across the Ba'ath Party. Um, I'll tell you this speculation about um, government. Uh, I, I do want to say that a lot of people, well, a lot of people, a lot of people on the U.S. West Coast really want the whole world to take a European kind of hands-off regulatory uh, strategy. And, uh, and they sort of want everything to merge. And a lot of, a lot of companies would like there to be only one set of rules to deal with. Um, I think that the, a better model is sort of this left on cloud model, where there's some people like, you know, France and Germany can work really hard to figure out how to do it ever closer union. Quite a lot of other countries says the EU can do that. I think there's other countries like Ukraine, uh, UK, uh, Turkey. Um, I don't know what's up with this one. They should, they should get with the plan. <laughs> but anyway, these, they, some countries for geographic reasons will always sort of be in the cloud, you know, between the, the, a couple of nuclei. They're, 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 sort of, they're sort of things that link the world together. They're not things that can be in one place or the other. Um, but I really think it's important to have diversity and that we should expect to have multiple jurisdictions. Although to the max, I, I do agree on using standards to try to make it as easy as possible to do transparency across different jurisdictions. But I think what is going to get enforced in different places will always vary. And it should, we want innovation. Um, so I don't think I have enough time to do the polarization thing. I just will tell you really quickly, it's, it's not about culture. It's not about social media use. There's tons of papers showing it's like, Literally, there's uh, you know, things that have been in nature, things that, that like people have done experiments. There's 499 articles. No one has, oh, and a book. There's a book, yeah. But this is a book about all the different other articles. There's no evidence that social media is driven, that social media drives um, polarization. If you weren't already polarized, then the amount of time you spend on social media doesn't change that. Okay. So um, on the other hand, there's a lot of data showing the polarization tends to correlate with inequality. And so we have a model explain why. <laughs> and I'll just say very quickly that our, our model, this is just the, the model that is the first account from the data that was already known, which was that basically we know, as I mentioned before, that working with a diversity gives you um, a higher expected outcome. That was already, there were papers about that. Our speculation then is, well, then why would you ever only work with an in-group but that's probably because uh, it's lower risk. You can better predict it. Well, why would you care more about the expected outcome? Only if you're right on the edge of losing something, right? So if you um, if you have if you're worried about bankruptcy, losing your house, losing your children, that kind of thing, then maybe you can't afford. You want you care more about the risk profile than about the expected outcome. And so that was, that was a paper that came out in December 2020. Like I said, it was the first, uh, it's, just, it's just the model, but it's the first account for what was already known in terms of data. Oh, and by the way, this only applies to inequality if it's allowed to create false scarcity. So the real problem is that as the economy gets smaller, people get closer to these cliffs that they, than they didn't expect. With, with inequality, a lot of, even if the economy is growing, more and more money is going to the very top and then everybody else is in that situation. However, actually China and, and Germany were two of the examples where we knew there wasn't this link. And this model also accounts for why that might be because China and Germany both invest a lot in trying to make sure people don't have these problems of precarity. So anyway, uh, I have a paper that was in the main political science uh, conference of uh, Europe last year and we're still trying to get around to submitting it. But this is relatively new graph off of it, and the predictions of the model hold. So, um, and income inequality turns out not to be the most significant uh, indicator of polarization. At uh, I mean, it is significant, but um, unemployment is actually an even bigger deal. And there's also a long been known that fractionalization gives you. It's it's not so much that it causes polarization um, as that uh, it it uh, it it opens a cleavage on which polarization becomes a more evident way to solve the problem. Solve the problem. Um, but the interesting thing is that one of the, my co-authors, uh, Vishali, was really interested in trust. 
And you can see that income inequality actually undermines trust really strongly. Um, and then we were also looking at this other thing, which was how much, uh, how many working people are there uh, that, that need, uh, well, I'm ask of that because I don't have much time. But you can see that unemployment is less important with trust. Uh, and the interesting thing at the micro level, sorry that this is like at this chart, but anyway, the, the, at the micro level, um, again, the, the most important thing is actually individuals care more about the economy for their polarization than they do about uh, their own uh, employment. Whereas for trust, their own employment and things like that matter uh, more. So, so trust and, economy and polarization are kind of the inverse of each other. And you could almost just simply explain polarization by saying that you trust is a luxury good and you tend to use it if you can afford it. But it's not quite like that. And the other thing that this is showing, I'm sorry, this regional, this is again the, uh, if you have suddenly access to more people uh, that can work and so your jobs are threatened, that's more important than everything else. So it does seem to be that the polarization cranks up when you've become more precarious. So that's a bit of a causal story there. Okay, so I've now taken longer than I meant to. Um, and I will just say, I'll <laughs> quickly going backwards. Uh, I just said this, um, but this thing about ethnic fractionalization, like I said, uh, there's this important paper that I think is under, hasn't been adequately recognized. It just came out earlier this year. But actually having ethnic minorities uh, is the best predictor of not having democratic backsliding in the current era. So it seems like, uh, again, echoing what I was saying before, what we do matters. It's the minorities realizing that democracies are what defends them work harder to prevent uh, democratic backsliding than, than uh, more homogenous uh, populations. That's just a hypothesis of one paper. But I think it's worth seeing, and, and uh, also there's a, Rio Reza talks a lot about what's happened in the current context. So in summary, justice is implemented by peers holding each other to account, and AI is not a peer because we own it and we design it, so it just isn't a peer. Um, it's a product. We improve its ethical application by improving best practice and holding companies to that, that holding them to doing due diligence. Yeah, it cannot be built safely, legally, to ensure suffering from dissuasion by pounds of law. I have a really famous paper that everybody thinks uh, uh, means that I hate robots. <laughs> robots should be slaves. But the point of that book, that paper was actually that um, why should we want AI to suffer? So it was like second order moral issues. We didn't want to put uh, uh, machines into a condition of, of servitude. We know that people shouldn't be owned. So why should we want machines to be people? Um, but I mean, everybody took it the wrong way. <laughs> and I never had to lose their credit on the first two papers in AI. Um, and, or at least they read the title. Anyway, uh, the other thing is that the capacity for freedom and self-determination can only be maintained by coordination. We, we have seen in the past, and we are seeing in parts of the world, uh, people being commodified. And so I think we need to work really hard to ensure that we have institutions watching after each other. We have to work together um, in order to maintain our own fundamental rights. We don't ask for the it for us. So thank you. Yeah, we create, we co-create with our peers. Those were my peers that helped with those. Uh, Grass. Yeah.